everybody. Thank you so much for coming to our channel on No Hate ALA. Um, so I, I'll introduce you to our speakers here. This is Stacy Collins of our very own Phoebe Library who um, has created the um, anti-oppression book guide here. This is Lena Gluck who has been um, a leader in the um, anti-fascist uh, Anti-Fascist Library, anti Library Network and yeah. the creator of the St. Bernard Library Spaces website. And we have Sophia Leon, who um, is a leader in the uh, group We Hear, uh, which is a collective of um, information professionals of color. Um, so, uh, and I'm Aola. I'm one of the officers for the, for the Progressive Librarians Guild. So please um, feel free to um, get up and have sandwiches or um, or uh, social water over there. I'm going to be sending around a, a sign-in sheet, so if you haven't signed up uh, yet, um, please sign that. And then, without further ado, I will have um, I'll have our speakers introduce more about themselves and sort of how they they um, reacted to the events of the summer. Would you like to start since we're Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So, yes, I'm a research and instruction librarian here at Beatley. I work with the social work and the children's literature folks. Um, I'm also an alum from Simmons. I got my master's in um, LIS and um, children's literature right over there. Uh, so, hello, you're all in the program. It'll end. It's going to be great. <laughs> yes. Um, and everybody's super excited to get you a job. So, it's all, it's all amazing. Um, so I'm trying. I was actually sort of thinking back and trying to remember when I became aware of this, and I think it was I was scrolling on a screen, which is not good when you're trying to go to sleep, things like that, all bad habits. Um, and I think it was I think it was something that was posted on Facebook where someone was like, "Did anybody see this newest interpretation out of the Office of Intellectual Freedom um, of the Library Bill of Rights?" And I was like, "Why? What?" And like went and looked and was massively horrified. Um, and then sort of took to Twitter to where a lot of conversation sort of happens in real time, but also very surreal time <laughs> as well. Um, and essentially, um, it sort of came as a surprise initially, like this sort of like, what? And then not long after it kind of settled into a, of course, of course this was an interpretation of how, of how this looks because we're in this particular historical moment that we are in. We have a lot of different groups that are coming out on a lot of sides of things. Um, and the more that becomes massive, the more folks are looking for spaces where they can organize, where they can speak. Um, and as I think Nina's going to talk about, there's a historical precedence for folks who are super invested in discriminating against others using public spaces, especially library spaces, where not only do they get, they get to also meet and talk about and sort of by implicitly validate what they're doing and what they're speaking for, but they also get to deny access to space to the folks that they ultimately don't like. Um, and so this interpretation, like, it makes sense in the sense that, like, libraries, public libraries especially, are sort of dealing with how to handle their space and how they give access to space in this moment. Um, but the interpretation is very, I'm, I'm not even, uh, obtuse, maybe, is the word? I'm not sure. Um, like, I don't want to pretend that, like, this wasn't given a great deal of consideration before it was put together and then ultimately signed off on. Somebody thought about this a great deal. Um, but it's it's really sort of enormous like blind spots around things like access to these folks means no access to others. Um, so how can you possibly strike that balance by a simple blanket policy of well everybody gets access when by act, by giving this access you literally deny it to others. Um, and also the safety um, and also uh, not not just safety like like physical safety is paramount but also like. People who work in a library, people who use a library, deserve to feel some modicum of, if not safety, then also comfort. Also, like I don't feel like I'm in danger working at the desk. Kinds of feelings are, are good. That should be a bare minimum of what libraries as spaces of employment offer um, to folks, especially marginalized folks who we do not have enough of in the field anyway. Uh, so yes, my reaction to this was very like, I can't believe it. And then very shortly after, no, I can definitely believe it because this is sort of a continuation of a lot of the conversations about how we do and do not live up to our own sort of ethical code around equity. Um, so uh, when I first heard about it, I think it was one of those pieces of political information that I got like 
late at night, right before I was about to fall asleep, and I was like, what is happening? Why? Again. Um, and so my, my first reaction upon finding out about some terrible decision that's been made is, who made the decision and who has the power to reverse it? And those are the people that I need to contact. Um, so I started looking into as much as I could about the events that led up to it in the most recent past and found out that um, basically how the interpretation works is that ALA Annual, um, the counselors um, had voted this interpretation in. But as more information came out, we discovered that several of the counselors who had voted in this language actually had no idea that they were voting in the language because the language was added last second before they voted with no announcement that any provision had been made further, um, which made a lot of folks in ALA at large and those counselors who you know feel very betrayed, um, particularly counselors of color and LGBT counselors and people who were being harmed by something that they were kind of forced into voting for. And so there was an immediate pushback on Twitter um, and that pushback came under the umbrella hashtag no hate ALA. Um, and um, so my, my role in kind of taking action with that is to reach out to everyone else who seemed very passionately engaged in no hate ALA conversation and dialogue and trying to get folks onto a platform where we could talk, you know, not um, under the scrutiny of all of Twitter, but to just kind of have our own little Slack channel where we could discuss strategies for how to address the problem, what we could do to make libraries safer, how to react to that new policy. Um, and that became the Anti-Fascist Library Network. And um, so our immediate um, thing that we decided on doing our initial tactic was to start a social media campaign to get everyone to flood all the counselors' emails with basic requests to um, rescind that um, meeting room interpretation and to just um, put all your reasons and citations and your views and just be like, you know, you represent me as a library worker and here's how I feel about this issue, please vote to rescind it. And that campaign um, was shared on Facebook and Tumblr and Twitter and um, probably other platforms, but I don't know about but those were the places I initially spread the seeds. And um, it actually was very successful, and that interpretation was rescinded by a landslide vote. Sophia, we're sort of talking about how we, um, or how, how you all um, found out about the found out about the decision and what your reaction was. Do you want to try again? Sophia, can you hear us? I can't hear. You. <laughs> no, we can't hear you. We can't hear you now. I don't know. Hello. Yay! Okay. <laughs> Okay, maybe there's something you can do here, and I um, 
Well, thanks, Diana, for calling me on here. I'm going to be here for a question. Kind of funny to me is I think, like anyone in that group, you're going to be a leader, right? The whole group is there for all of us. If you want to do something, you just, now that there's a group of us and we can contact each other, we can just go in and, um, you know, pull a collective together of people who just want to do different. In this case, the Duke can come and organize a group of us to write the petition, which really was a group effort. Um, and I'm really glad that everyone pitched in because I, I didn't know what I was doing there. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I mean, it's still up there because I haven't done anything. And I guess the one reason, the main reason it angers me, I mean, if any reason, but the main one is that it, it doesn't think about how this impacts, again, the same group of people. I'm sure that both Stacy and Lena talked about this night. <laughs> um, and this is where a lot of public libraries and some academic libraries like on the smaller side might look to create their state policies um, and saying that this kind of language is okay and that hate speech doesn't hurt anyone it's just speech um, which I'm sure all of you know is not true so I guess it, it puts me in a very angry uh, I, I love you have another So, did, so, so some of you talked about some some, some specific things. So, can you talk about um, Sophia? Maybe could you talk about the petition? Um, and Lena, could you talk about the um, the like more details about the specific campaign that you did? And Stacy, any more details that you would like to add? Brought up. 
a conversation around ALA as a representative body. Like there were small little branches of conversation that were happening, particularly online, around um, why is ALA our only sort of wide scope national organization when we could absolutely have two. Um, why does everything seem to sort of, why is ALA sort of an umbrella for all of librarianship when like it doesn't have to be. Um, which was an interesting conversation, especially once when this petition went up um, and the numbers grew to encouraging sizes. Um, folks, privileged folks, started asking, um, well, how many of these people are dues paying members in sort of like a, because if you're not, your vote doesn't matter, what you, you sign this petition doesn't matter. And so folks started signing the petition with like their ALA ID numbers, which is beautiful. Um, and also like, no, if you're going to be a representative body for the field, it doesn't matter if somebody who is not able to be a dues-paying member because our field doesn't pay us enough to be dues-paying members <laughs> all the time. Um, and like, why pay dues if this is the kind of thing that you're going to do as a body? Um, so yes, it was. It felt very. It felt very like ALA was just this big, clumsy creature that was just doing things without actually checking in with anybody who's like out in the field. It's like, yeah, literally no one is safe if we're just going to allow violent white supremacists into our meeting space. Like, not just the most vulnerable and marginalized among us, but literally everyone. Um, I would also say, I don't remember what Sophia just, like, specifically just said, but I just want to say that I, it is a small goal of mine to be sued by a white supremacist. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely for my work in a library. Like, I hope, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm excited. Um, but I fully agree in this idea of like that we have a responsibility to actually live our values rather than performing them. And while I appreciate the importance of intellectual freedom, the importance of the office, and why and why it exists, um, it, not only was this interpretation extremely poor, um, that was not nuanced, did not consider what actual libraries and librarians do and how we go about supporting communities, etc. Um, it didn't take into effect into account things like librarians make decisions all the time that sort of deny people access um, that our Bill of Rights says they're supposed to have all the time. Try going into any public library and swearing near the children's room. <laughs> or talking about the fact that queer people exist near the children's room. And inevitably, someone who hears you who works there is going to say, would you mind moving over here? And it's like, well, I'm not in the children's room. I'm right here. Why do I have to, why do I have to move? And they will explain, or they won't explain, they'll just say move. Um, Decisions like that happen all the time. Emily Dorinsky, in all of her brilliance and wisdom, talked about, um, during her commentary on whether libraries are neutral or not, talked about how we make decisions every day that aren't neutral about, we have a finite budget. What money gets spent on um, here doesn't get spent here. When access is given here, it can't be given here, et cetera. And it's about balancing the needs of a community that aligns with our ethics and the whole purpose behind a library existing. Um, and I find, I think this, interpretation hinges on, if a folks familiar with the Library Bill of Rights, y'all read it like recently or anything? Maybe? For class? Mm -hmm. Nah? Okay. <laughs> well, number, number three is about censorship and how we don't like it. And number five is about a person's right to use the library no matter who they are, what their background is, or what their views are. Now that sounds pretty like exactly what they were trying to say, like, hey, just a reminder, no matter what their views, you have to let them in the library. Um, the problem with like, Bills of Rights, though, is that not a single group of humans has written a good one, or, or one that has been lasting for all the time. That's why our own here in this country has a bunch of amendments, because the group that wrote them ends up having a particularly skewed view of the world, usually one that's uh, skewed particularly by intersections of privilege. Right? So the idea that like a Bill of Rights needs to change, that a Bill of Rights might have some things that actually, in fact, aren't correct or actually practicable in support of a community, it's just kind of reality. Um, and the Office of Intellectual Freedom likes to deal in sort of the black and white, everyone has, has access or no one does because that's how it works. Um, and I was just saying before we got started that like, great, the Office of Intellectual Freedom has given us an interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights. Where are the other offices' interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights? I'd love to see that. I'd love to see MIT's interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights. Because um, I know like Harvard, you can't get in that library. You can't use the library if you're not affiliated with Harvard. Right? So the fact that everybody's supposed to have access no matter who they are, what their background is, et cetera, is kind of interesting when this library that's a library and subscribes to the Bill of Rights and is meant to uphold the same ethical code as everybody else can say, 
no, you can't come in here because you literally just didn't pay tuition money to be affiliated with Harvard, or you're not an employee, so you can't be in here without special permission or some such. Um, which is all really to say, like, not to not to bash Harvard, um, <laughs> but rather to say that like each library um, builds itself and builds its policies around the needs of a community. And if a community is best served by isolating access for just those who pay into the school, or like the Athenaeum who pay into the library itself, then that's what you build around. And that's how you that's how you build service for your community. And the folks that are served best by that community are the folks that use it. Um, and so, uh, yes, I, 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 I'm very grateful for this interpretation from the, from the Office of Intellectual Freedom that has now been rescinded. Um, I'd love to see an interpretation by some of our other offices, like our offices of accreditation that tell us what we're supposed to have learned when we get an MLIS, what we're supposed to leave um, with. I'd love to see an interpretation from the Office of, wait, I'm going to, Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach? That sounds right. <laughs> there's, definitely, there's definitely, there's so many letters in there. I'd love to hear their interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights. Um, and, there, and for there to be a conversation about how one office doesn't kind of get a monopoly, um, no, neither does one organization get a monopoly, or even one library, or rather libraries, the Bill of Rights is meant to be guidelines for each individual library to build service that is in service of their communities. Okay. Um, so I know that the, the specific question I'm responding to is on... Could you speak up? The, yeah. Sorry. I know the specific question I'm responding to is on the campaign, but I kind of want to go into a little bit more bouncing off of what Stacy was talking about, um, where the, the conversations that started with this um, recent revision of the interpretation, the ongoing debates that unfolded within ALA, primarily the side that was supporting the revision was trying to argue in hypotheticals. There were a lot of very abstract um, slippery slope arguments or like what does intellectual freedom mean in the abstract philosophical sense and one of the things that I have tried to do in guiding the conversation because I think it's really important is grounding it back into the material world um, and I think that it's really important that we talk in practical terms. Like, as you were saying, specific examples, specific libraries. Like, what are we talking about in material terms? Who is being excluded? Um, and one of the things that is really interesting about this specific issue with hate groups and meeting rooms is that the citations that were included on the initial revision um, went back to two different cases in which a white supremacist group um, tried to book a meeting room, the library denied them, and then they sued the library. And the interesting part about those two citations is that it was the same white supremacist group. And if you look into the history of it, the same white supremacist group um, used this tactic of terrorizing communities over and over and over again in all sorts of different public libraries um, from the year 2000 to the year 2002. And um, I wrote myself up a timeline because I can't even remember them all because there were so many. Bloomington Public Library on October 28, 2000. Um, in 2001, on March 11th, um, they did the Wallingford Public Library. On March 25th, the Schoenberg Township District Library. Um, then uh, the Martin Memorial Library on January 14th, 2002. Um, and the Chicago Public Library in um, March 6th, and on May 4th of 2002, the Tab Library in Yorktown, Virginia, and on September 14th, the Lucius Bailey Memorial Library in Wakefield, um, and in December, the Baltimore County Public Library. Um, and this was just repetitive and you know it was a vicious tactic and it's very reminiscent to me like obviously this happened before my particular activism because I'm not that old but um <laughs> so I'm very young to it but um like what's going on right now in um you know particularly locally in Boston is you know every few months the local fascists around here will rally in the Boston Common and they just try this tactic repeatedly over and over again and they were doing 
you know, this particular group, um, which is now called the Creativity Movement, but at the time it used to be called the World Church of the Creator and was led by a neo-Nazi named Matt Hale. Um, that one, you know, that was their tactic, was to go into libraries um, and try to use the meeting rooms to rally, and it would inevitably lead to violence. And so, in a lot of cases, the entire library would have to be shut down for the whole day and roads would be closed off. And so you think about this in material terms, and allowing this white supremacist group to use the meeting rooms meant disallowing literally every other member of the community from getting library services or materials for that whole day. So it was like, not only were the rights being, you know, prioritized over somebody else who might use the meeting room, but they were being prioritized over the entire community, and that was exactly the point. Um, because while they were using that meeting room for that entire day, then, you know, no people of color were safe to use it, no Jewish people were safe to use it, no LGBT people were safe to use it, and it just became really chaotic. And um, then every time libraries would try to stand up for their communities, then they would try to sue the libraries. And so then these libraries were being met with you know, these people who are very good at spinning things. Um, and the, the kind of free speech um, co-opting by fascists and, you know, other hate groups has been a long-standing, you know, tactic that they've been using. Um, you, again, you see it here in Boston when, you know, the um, neo-fascists here will rally in the common and call it a free speech rally, but, like, you all know what it actually is about. and. They used it there, and I've even found in the literature looking into different court cases that um, libraries have lost um, on grounds of free speech. There was one case where a library, um, you know, kicked out somebody who had been repeatedly sexually harassing one of the librarians on staff, and then he sued the library and won and called it a free speech issue, because apparently sexual harassment sounds free speech, do you know? Um, and so yeah, this is a tactic that a lot of terrible people use, um, and the fact that we don't, one of the reasons that the library lost that case was because they didn't have specific enough policy on the books um, to, like, against sexual harassment. They didn't have anything specifically saying that that wasn't allowed, and so um, the sexual harasser was able to spin it as him being kicked out for his views which was sexual harassment. Um, <laughs> so this is a kind of ongoing thing. And I guess one of my main points in talking about this is that this is not an abstract debate on intellectual freedom. This is about specific cases of a white supremacist group targeting libraries as a tactic and the very real possibility that other white supremacist groups could be copycat and try that tactic themselves and what we're doing to defend ourselves and whether or not we support these libraries when they are inevitably facing people who are trying to terrorize their communities. And, you know, in a morally conscious, like, soul, I feel, would see this issue and be like, wow, we really need to dedicate more resources to public libraries for these court cases. You know, if they're being sued by white supremacists and they're trying to defend their communities, we need to support them in that and make sure that they win these cases. But instead, ALA responded by making it 10 times harder for them to defend themselves and basically saying, well, you should just cave in. And that's just completely unacceptable. And I do not appreciate how often people try to use abstract and vague terms in order to maneuver the conversation away from talking about that material reality. Um, yeah, so that's a long rant. I didn't actually answer the question, so now I'll answer the question for the actual campaign. So um, with me being very fired up with a lot of other people who are very fired up, um, we were talking tactics about what we could do to try to influence things. And, um, you know, there were a lot of different options on the table, everything, um, you know, early on, the uh, We Hear um, petition was, like, very big, and we were all, you know, like, signing on to that, but then, um, you know, that got shot down because of, you know, racist reasons, like, let's be frank, and, um, 
And so we were like, okay, we need like new tactics, you know, what's available, there were conversations happening on Twitter about whether or not we should just have like a mass exodus from ALA and just like drop it. You know, everyone who had memberships to just drop it. Um, that was a very real possibility and we were, you know, kind of weighing the pros and cons of how effective that would be to change things, um, again, like in a material way. Um, and one of the things that was brought up um, by a couple of people within the anti-fascist library network was that there are a lot of libraries across the country that their meeting room policies literally are just like the default to whatever ALA says. And so in changing what their interpretation is, you're effectively changing things in a large number of public libraries, and that's important. Um, so we wanted to actually address the interpretation itself and to get the recent revision rescinded, um, particularly because there were also counselors who didn't want to have made the vote that they did because they were doing so without having a fully informed um, position. So um, we decided that the best way to do this um, would be to make a lot of noise about it and get people to be contacting their counselors um, as representatives and you know to email them directly and engage um, and not many people knew about the issue that it was even happening and you know an even smaller number of people had any idea like how to contact their counselors or who their counselors were um, because the ALA website is kind of a labyrinth when you're first getting started on it. Um, so we wanted to try to come up with a way where we could come up with an image that could be easily shareable and, you know, come with links um, that would just hyperlink to the easiest possible way to contribute. And so, you know, we kind of had messages that people could use and we had um, links to specifically the page that lists contact you know, the forms to contact all of your ALA counselors, and we encourage people, you know, please contact your counselors, you know, submit through this form, explain why you want them to vote yes to rescind the recent interpretation. And um, we had a um, image on the top of our little, like, viral picture that was of a protest where um, someone had a sign that said, Nazis equal bad, this shouldn't be hard. And, uh, and so that was very effective for getting people to share it. Um, and we had a specific like um, date by which people had to contact counselors by because that's when they were going to begin voting. And as the folks within Antifascist Library Network were contacting counselors and getting responses, we had a you know, live spreadsheet going with who responded in which ways and how we thought people were going to vote. Um, and that was, you know, it was very interesting because the people who were like voting yes to rescind it, when you would email them, they would be like, thank you so much for engaging, absolutely, I'm voting yes, like, yeah, thank you for being an And then the people who were going to vote no to not rescind it were like, well, this is a very complex issue and I don't feel comfortable discussing my vote. <laughs> so you could kind of tell. Um, yeah, it was very interesting, the different kinds of responses. But, um, but it ended up being successful, and I was so, I was really nervous, I won't lie, because only 25% of counselors had actually responded to me by the time the vote went through. Um, and so I was very nervous, because that leaves a whole lot of people up in the air. But I found out um, through Emily Dravinsky, actually, uh, <laughs> that it was like a landslide vote very early on before it was officially announced and so we were like yay but also the fight doesn't stop here but temporarily yay <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, and so the phase two of the effort um, has been and I can talk about this more in a little bit but has been the safer library spaces website and that is our other um, side of our tactic um, the interpretation is kind of a top-down tactic and the website is more of a grassroots one um, and the idea is that if you can get individual libraries to each change their policy, then ALA interpretation is meaningless because you already have um, inclusive policy on the books, um, you know, that protect marginalized people um, in all your local libraries. Um, and so that's what the website 
the trestles. So I was talking to someone uh, last week, an acquaintance of mine, about the fact that I was coming to this panel. Uh, he was not nearly as excited about it as I was. <laughs> um, and he asked a couple of questions that I didn't actually have answers to, so I thought sure. I'd ask you guys. Um, which is, first of all, how, like, typically, how do we define hate groups? Um, but then also, like, the role that the ALA plays as a governing body. Um, this I'm still in my first semester in the program, so I haven't, like, I don't know that much about, like, is it actually, you know, is it a governing thing? Is it, is it like the pirate code? It's more like a set of guidelines and actual rules or things like that. Did you want to Sophia, do you have, did you want to maybe answer that first? Maybe why don't one of you start, um, and then I can come All right. First of all, I would say ALA is a network, professional networking body. It is not a governing body. Um, it is an accrediting body. So everything that you learn from an ALA accredited MLIS program, the Office of Accreditation has said, has literally investigated and checked off and everything that's in your syllabi, in your program, your learning objectives, the things you're supposed to, the knowledge you're supposed to come out with, they accredit as this is what a librarian should know at the end of their MLIS, this is what it means to have a master's in this program, and then off you go into your career. Um, and then they are also, the, the offices of ALA do things like, um, not only interpretation, but also sort of like defining terms around intellectual freedom, um, around um, our ethical code, et cetera. Was the ethical code written by ALA? I don't remember. <laughs> so, but as a professional networking body, it's a, it's meant to be sort of a representative group. If they if they had their way, what they'd like is everybody who's a librarian would also be a member of ALA. But you can obviously be a librarian without being a member of ALA or doing anything with them. Um, so no, they don't they don't govern us. Um, but it is sort of the same deal. Of like yeah, they don't govern us, but they are highly influential. If only because you have to pay a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, to be a member, and so like it's just like wow, I literally have a monetary investment in being a part of this group. I guess I should take what they say seriously. Like I'm literally going to defend them because otherwise I've spent money for no reason. And nobody <laughs> likes that feeling. Uh, so th things like that, and yes, literally whole groups that are like we don't have the space, the time, the resources to actually um, build policy ourselves. Our staff are new every two years or something like that, um, and it becomes a well if we've got this like neatly handed down from ALA, that's great. And in many in many spaces, that's very useful. Um, ACRL, which is like a branch of ALA, um, provides like the information literacy frames for folks within academic libraries to use and um, not only interpret, but sort of put into practice. Um, they create, um, I'm not gonna remember what it's called, but essentially like a list of, like a list of must-haves in terms of collections um, for different like disciplines. It's sort of like, like a starter pack, um, which is great and really useful from a professional networking body that's trying to like help our field get to a place where everybody feels they're they're able to serve their community to the best of their ability, and considering librarianship as a field as sort of a knowledge trust, a best practices trust, where we learn from each other and serve our communities the best by sharing the things that have worked the best. Um, but it also has the unfortunate consequence of like when somebody has a bad idea <laughs> and they're able to get it published somewhere um, or officially put into something like an interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights, that can have a massive like ripple effect of libraries just either not, in, not interrogating it at all and simply adopting it because it's ALA. Um, and a number of people, again, sort of like, well, it's a complicated issue. I'm not personally affected by it, and I paid money to be part of this thing. Um, so I'm not gonna, I don't, I'm not gonna automatically write it off, et cetera, et cetera. So ALA, not a governing body, but still a very influential one. I would add to that also that one of the dangers in this kind of thing is particularly in instances when a library is being sued um, by one of these groups that ALA documentation can be used against the library um, and that's one of the dangers because if you are a small public library and you don't have a lot of funds from your city to go to court over this um, and the you know group that you're trying to deny space to is suing you over free speech, whatever, and then you're like, look, you know, libraries should not have to endanger the community 
things, you know, to prioritize hate groups over everybody else. You know, we need this space. Um, and we have behavioral policies against this issue, and et cetera. And then, you know, the opposition's lawyer can always bring out ALA, you know, write-ups being like, well, your professional organization says that you should be welcoming hate groups. And, you know, what do you say to that? And sort of very quickly, you know, kind of sway opinion, and it makes it much more difficult to argue with these things in court. Um, The largest library organization um, or professional library organization. So, you know, if you don't belong to ALA, there's not really anything else <laughs> sometimes, which I think why, if you haven't already explored um, the Twitterverse of Critlib and other online communities, that's an useful place to go. Um, the other thing that, I mean, ALA is not the only one responsible for this. But the professional culture as a whole, I mean, sure, we can talk about intellectual freedom and hate speech all we want, but when we talk about the more similar ways in which we police people's behavior at work or our patrons or like what we allow in libraries and what we don't, um, and like, you know, the diversity problem that libraries have, I mean, there's a reason for that, right? There's a reason they can't recruit, retain librarians of color um, because of this white culture that is allowed to just continue. Um, and of course, ALA is one of the biggest proponents of that. So in thinking about whether you want to join, I mean, I guess people have differing opinions about how best to approach this, right? Like, I think I had a conversation with someone about this on Twitter. Like, you could decide to continue paying dues Maybe if you can afford it, become a council member because you basically have to fund your own way to get to ALA and you're required to go as a council counselor. Um, sure, and that's like one way to change it from the inside. I guess the other way um, would be organizing a totally different organization and association. Um, I think that one's a little harder since you have to build something from scratch. And I don't know, I mean, like, we need all those ways. and and more, and I think it's important that we talk about these things in library school, because we didn't really do that when I was in library school. Um, I'm not sure how many library schools are actually talking about this. I know at work we didn't really talk about this at all, because, um, well, not to be like MIT is like this, but it might be a little like, we don't really care what other people do. <laughs> 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 um, but, you know, like other smaller organizations, smaller um, libraries, they definitely are going to pay attention to what ALA does and, you know, everything that um, Stacey and Nina already said. So I, you know, at the same time, we can't, like, throw it out because currently that's all we have. Um, and I guess my current approach is to infiltrate and change it from the inside out. But that's also my approach to libraries in general because I think a lot of change still needs to happen um, and we're still very far from where we need to be. So just to make sure the other part of that question was the issue of how um, hate groups are defined. Yeah. Could you speak to that a little? Sure. <laughs> Um, it's one that has been introduced um, a lot into the conversation, and I think, honestly, there, there's a couple different angles that the question has been asked through, and I kind of want to address that there's a particular phrasing of the issue that I've heard repeated over and over again that is absolutely reads as a dog whistle to me and I feel super uncomfortable about it and the way that that like kind of racist phrasing will go is like who is you know to determine what is a hate group and what isn't because while some people you know consider the KKK a hate group other people might consider Black Lives Matter a hate group or something like that's the way the question has been phrased to me over and over again it's very gross um, and <laughs> that um, that kind of false equivalency, I think, is kind of the underbelly of a lot of 
that rhetoric. And um, I think, you know, the most effective way that I've been able to combat that question is to be very blunt with people who ask it, especially within ALA. And I'm like, you're an information professional, and you can't understand the difference between two completely different types of information. Like, if you can't understand the difference between racial justice and death threats, you know, like, I don't, you don't belong in the profession. Like, you're a disgrace to, like, information <laughs> professionalism. Um, and, you know, if anyone is to determine what is a hate group and what isn't, you know, like, what, how we're defining it, like, should not, should we not as information professionals give guidance to our communities in that avenue? Like, we shouldn't just throw up our hands and be like, well, nobody knows what's anything. Words are meaningless. Like, no. <laughs> you know, we're the librarians. Like, people turn to us for trusted information. We should put some thought into it and actually give them, like, you know, this is reliable information and this isn't. Like, we need to be able to make those distinctions. And it's absolutely pathetic to me that so many people in our profession have just kind of thrown up their hands and been like, well, nobody knows anything. That's so ridiculous. Um, but in a, in a more practical sense, when that question has been asked from more genuine people who are not just, you know, trying to be racist, um, when people are like, okay, so, you know, if information professionals are, you know, creating policy um, that would protect marginalized people, um, then, you know, how do we define it within policy? And that's a very different um, question. And my personal view and um, the view of a lot of the folks within the Antifascist Library Network is that you need to be specific or else it will be used as a tool against marginalized people. Um, and so, for example, you know, if you're writing policy and you're saying, you know, we do not, um, you know, a lot of uh, libraries, their initial impulse will be something like, you know, we don't allow racist speech or we don't allow <laughs> racist groups. Um, but with the wrong people in power, that can easily be leveraged in shitty ways, and we all know that. Um, and so we advocate for more specific and, you know, say, you know, no white supremacist views, you know, no white supremacist speech. Um, so that way it can't be twisted around. Nobody could possibly try to argue that Black Lives Matter was preaching white supremacy, like, it's not going to work. Um, and so the more specific you are, the more you have that defense built in. Um, and it can't be as easily subverted. Um, if you speak specifically to, um, you know, we don't allow, you know, homophobia and transphobia within the space, um, instead of, you know, that way it's less easily manipulated um, to say, you know, like, we don't allow offensive, you know, etc. because then a group could say, well, I'm offended by the existence of these people. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, specific is good. Um, so really what I advocate is to have a coherent definition of what we mean when we talk about fascistic groups, not necessarily like hardcore fascist groups, although they are also a part of this because they are real and they actually do this, it's not a hypothetical, but, um, but just general like fascistic ideology, what we mean when we say that, you know, in 2018, the United States, like be specific, what are we talking about? And if you can be specific with that, then I think that that's a very effective way to approach those issues. Um, and on the Safer Library Spaces website, um, the Antifascist Library Network has what we currently use as our definition of, you know, what um, fascistic violence entails and, you know, how we would phrase a policy that um, keeps them out and keeps other people safe. So, yeah. And I deal, not deal, um, a lot of some of the things that I do um, with workshops and presentations and conversations with other librarians deals with sort of like the underside, what sort of like feeds into this is like, oh, we don't know what to do because anything can be a hate group. Um, like every, everybody's a hate group, therefore we should never be a hate group. It is really more a lack of education around um, the social structures and power structures that, yeah. that make racism operate. The idea that like if you say you cannot have that racist speech is not allowed in the library. The idea that like someone can say, well, that person just um, insulted a white person for being white, 
you'll have a lot you'll have a lot of librarians who do not understand that that in fact is not racism in fact can't be racism and they will say oh you're right I guess I have to kick that person out instead of like well that's not actually what racism is sir let's um I have these slides <laughs> and if you have, a, if you have a cool 45 minutes I'll be happy to talk to you about what what this actually means so not only being specific but also being specific around definitions and lots and lots of training and education like this should like we talk about this the, the accreditation of is um, what it means to sort of have an LIS, what we do and don't talk about in library science. Like, we, the conversation about, like, what racism is doesn't happen. Like, how, how, I don't know, considering, like, public libraries are li literally on the front lines of the most marginalized populations in our country coming to them to use services, um, and has swiftly sort of become, like, this is part of what libraries do. Like when they talk about supporting community, we're often talking about supporting the community, the parts of our community that have no support elsewhere. Um, so like this conversation that has come out and this, this interpretation that has sort of come out, kind of it hinges on this idea of like, we really don't like censorship. It makes us all squiggy and upset. Um, some people like literally like start crying and screaming. Um, we are not in the, in, the, in the world of censorship because in the world of censorship is where books get burned and then we, we riot. Um, but it's really like they're a, a nuanced understanding around. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yay. Uh, but a nuanced understanding of how censorship works also has to do with power structures, right? Like, I cannot censor someone who, the moment they step out of the library, has a world stage, has a world platform, is empowered in probably every possible way. Um, like sitting in the library and saying, nope, you can't. You cannot sit in this space and talk about doing violence to marginalized people. Um, or just like, I have control over my budget and I'm not going to spend money on this book that's really transphobic. Um, I'm going to buy this book that's really uplifting of the trans community instead. Um, those are decisions that, are not, that do not amount to censorship because censorship implies that somehow you have blotted out all access to a thing. Um, and that's, not, that's simply not how social power structures work. And a lot, like we have, we sort of like this have this like dream neutrality of the library where when somebody steps inside the library doors, they've entered a space of complete equal footing. And it's like, that's silly. We are cultural constructions. We were literally created by the cultures that surround us. And actually, our origin purposes are not that pretty. They're actually quite icky and quite about holding, not only upholding the status quo, but making, but like crushing people, other people, to make sure that the status quo stayed the way it was. We have since shifted, but. It's about like actually engaging with this and saying like what is our actual purpose as a public library in this community? Are we really about being a space where everyone is equal? Or rather, if we are about that, then doesn't that mean that these people need to have the exact same voice as these people, as opposed to oh well, you know, the straight parents are going to get real upset if on summer reading we have Entango makes three, so we're not going to put it on there. It's like well, no, nope, we could put it on there instead. Tango makes three is also it's on the banned books list, the top lit challenge books list again. Um, it's like, well, we could put it on there and to make the queer parents happy and the queer kids feel validated um, instead of worrying about whether this person is angry because in these library doors, your anger is not more important than this person's happiness. Your anger is more important outside the doors, but it's not here. Yes, sorry, and that wasn't answering your question at all. <laughs> <laughs> So it seems oh, um, so it seems like for the in order to make the bill of rights, I don't know how many people are in the decision making, but it seems like they need to like open it up more to the other. Just looking on the website because of, yeah yeah I think there's like because I mean differences. yeah that sounds right somewhere around that number um, yeah. Because there's there's counselors for each state, and then there's counselors, multiple counselors sometimes for different um, roundtables and um, stuff. Yeah, and there's um, I just want to read this. So just the just a little date history of the many times this has been sort of like amended and affirmed. So it was originally adopted in June of 1939. Would you like to take a guess as to what that group of librarians maybe looked like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the ALA Council. It was amended in October of 1944, at the end of the war, mm -hmm. um, and then again in 48, 61, 67, 80, and 1996. 
and then we've just had a reinterpretation, but the, the actual like Bill of Rights has not been sort of like adjusted since 1996. Um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think, where are, where are we here? 1996 is the start of the Generation Z, I think that's right, 96 and forward is Generation Z? It depends on who you ask, it's like the tail end of millennials, the very beginning of Gen Z. All right, but like, a new generation has come, has, has somewhere around there come into being, <laughs> and that's the last time that we looked at the Library Bill of Rights, which was set into, was set into motion by probably a very white, a very cisgender, a very straight, actually it might, might, not, might not have been very male, but I'm sure there were dudes there. Um, <laughs> in, 19, in 1939, it has since shifted and changed, but we haven't looked at it in the last 22 years. We get reinterpretations like this, and it's like, well, what if we rewrote it? Like, how about, how, instead of, actually, instead of an interpretation from the Office of Diversity, Literacy, and Outreach, instead, I'd like, I'd like you to rewrite them. Rewrite them and put that forward, just to see what it means. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure it answered it really at all. Um, well, I was thinking like the problem is like I know there are library associations that aren't directly connected with ALA, and it seems like this Bill of Rights is, is, is kind of like imposing it on them too. Kind of. So and it's, like, are the Library Bill of Rights connects to some of like the basic tenets of librarianship that came out of like Cutter and other dead people? Um, but also things like our code of ethics, right, are sort of put together. And that's sort of like ALA's function as a professional network is supposed to be a space and an organization where folks within the profession come together to have a conversation about what our ethical code is and should look like, what should be adopted, what folks should know coming out of an LIS program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so there are lots of organizations that aren't part of ALA, um, especially local local organizations that aren't part of ALA, um, but that doesn't stop it. That like doesn't stop ALA. <laughs> yeah, just the monster. Um, it does ALA as a professional organization. Any smaller group of professionals is ultimately under this umbrella, whether they like it or not. It sort of blots out the sun. Uh, you had a question. There was actually a lot of overlap with that question. I just liked what you were bringing up about like why haven't any other groups made interpretations, and I wanted to ask if there are any examples, even if it's small, but I think. Already covered it, so I guess there are not. Not, I don't, I don't think not in the sense of like from an organ, from another organization. Yeah, I, I mean, the the closest thing I can think to is the Press of Librarians Guild has their own statements on like what they stand for, um, and that looks radically different from ALA, but it doesn't link to be an interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights. It's like a common thing. Mm -hmm. um, the Zine librarians have something similar. Again, but not a, like anything sort of officially challenging. Like, right. well, what if we had this Bill of Rights? Instead? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, good a good thing to try. Like, ask if, I don't know, ask a professor and say, like, hey, could we just real quick do an interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights, or could we like try writing a new one, or something like that? Um, I mean, it's it's really hard to write something vague enough that it can be used across an entire profession. And you start you start getting a lot of, I mean literally if you look at it, you get a lot of platitudes that sound really good in a socially just society um, that doesn't exist around us. Um, so it's like, all right, so this is sort of like an ideal, like almost a vision statement. We would like to be in a society and be a library that can operate this way and welcome people at this level, but also that's not our reality, so then what? How high do you think the risk is for something like this happening again soon? And if it does, what do we do? Like, yeah. Um, well, uh, Matt Hale, that white supremacist I was talking about, who repeatedly used this tactic, um, the reason that that stopped in 2002 is because he threatened to assassinate a federal judge and he's now in prison. So it's slim chances, yeah, for the next 40 years, there's slim chance that that particular group is going to use that tactic. Um, but what concerns me is, you know, post-2016 election, you know, there has been a rise in these groups being very vocal and out in the open and showing up at public places. And I don't think that, you know, 
we can guarantee that no other group will be using this tactic actively, um, particularly if ALA is making a big deal about welcoming hate groups um, explicitly, like they will absolutely use that. <laughs> um, so that's particularly troubling because it's basically putting like a big target on all public libraries being like, hey, come harass us. Um, and it, it's just very uncomfortable. Um, as far as like whether or not we will be faced with another terrible ALA interpretation, that's up in the air right now because they are currently revising it and we have no idea what they're going to publish. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, it's worth, it's worth mentioning that this, ter this terrible interpretation, I feel, came out of a place of wanting to protect libraries from being sued. Not protecting individual library workers, which would be a nice, be a nice impulse, um, but more like, hey, we know we like we feel like public libraries are maybe feeling kind of on the spot and wanting to say like, oh, you can't have hate speech and hate groups in the library, but actually that could lead you down a terrible road that's going to lead to even more problems. So just be be aware that like it's actually kind of better. La 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 la. Um, the thing is, is like you can go you can go about that in a much better way. You can go about that and say things like, hey, there are. Um, legal precedents around white supremacists being able to use our spaces, mm -hmm. but I'd like just so be aware that that's a thing and that if you decide to bar hate groups um, or specific groups from the library, they have the ability to sue you and there's legal precedent that supports them. But also, here's things that you can maybe try doing instead. Specific policies are very helpful, um, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of just a, I don't know, is it like, has everybody actually like read sort of like the sentence that says this? Um, a, public, a publicly funded library is not obligated to provide meeting room space to the public, but if it chooses to do so, it cannot discriminate or deny access based upon the viewpoint of speakers or the content of their speech. This encompasses religious, political, and hate speech. So like, our Office of Intellectual Freedom literally was like, yeah, we acknowledge that hate speech is definitely happening, but you still don't, like, didn't even like try to sugarcoat it as like, speech that might seem <laughs> icky, hateful, no, no, like, no, it's definitely hate speech, but you still have to allow it. And it's like, that's unacceptable. Like, that's an unacceptable interpretation of what it is that libraries do and what we are duty-bound um, to offer in terms of service and support. Right. Garbo, I forget the second part of her last name, I'm sorry. Um, she's going on a tour, actually, of library, public libraries across the country, I heard. Um, so she's actually going to be here, and I think she's going to be in Cambridge Public Library or something. I can't remember exactly what the event is or like how it's being publicized, because I heard about it through work, and apparently she wants, cause she wants to stop by MIT also. Um, but I mean, that's one way, like, you know, sort of going back to talking to your representative that we supposedly voted for and all that thing. Sorry about that. He's being very annoying right now. Um, my other thought is, I guess, that I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again. Because this kind of thing happens all the time, whether it's ALA or, you know, your own library, like somebody does something. And I think that, like, the thing about being an ally is, always being prepared for this kind of behavior um, and this kind of thing happening so that you do have something ready to go when it happens again. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say that like for some, I came in a little late, but for historical background, like ALA was uh, founded by a bunch of white guys in the late 19th century, one of whom a uh, very important founder was Melville Dewey, who your daily reminder was a serial sexual harasser. Um, so I think there's something to be said that um, in the DNA of the organization is are a lot of problematic, you know, yeah. white supremacist, misogynist elements. Um, and so I guess how I feel is if it's going to change for the better, like that change would have to be extremely radical, like you're suggesting like rewriting these documents that have been around for like you know almost a century, but I think that would require a great change in the um, membership and counselors in terms of representation. Um, but then the other alternative would be to 
create alternative spaces um, and sort of push ALA away from being this central body. So I guess, I don't know, like, it seems like a far goal to, like, create a second, like, professional organization, but in terms of, like, pressure on ALA, in terms of people who um, were, you know, maybe, like, going to stop being, mem look, stop being members or stop going to annual or something, I wonder, like, like what kinds of pressure to put on ALA. I mean, like, for now, they've, they've, you know, they're rescinding of it. I, you know, obviously, if they had kept the the revision as it was, I wouldn't have felt comfortable paying dues or going to mm -hmm. annual or whatever. Um, like is it possible to boycott ALA? Yeah, I mean, I would certainly do it if they continue to do shitty things. I mean, sometimes it's literally not possible to pay the dues to participate in ALA, oh, so yeah, it's actually well, quite easy to boycott. <laughs> um, I will say, I would I would kind of love a headline one day that says millennials are killing ALA. <laughs> <laughs> I, would like, I would like that a lot. Um, but yeah, no, exactly. So like not just, not simply dropping out, but literally making some kind of statement and saying the reason I am not putting money into this organization is because while there are many benefits to it, I cannot in good conscience support this thing monetarily that continues to do this and continues to implicitly dictate, if not overtly dictate policy for so many public libraries. I'm not going to put money, I'm not going to put $400 towards it um, and I'm going to organize my practice um, in a more ethical and social justice sort of sort of way and sort of being explicit like I'm not leaving just because I can't pay and I'm not leaving just because I whatever don't never use the circle like literally I'm not I'm not staying because this organization has done things that I'm not okay with um, and not okay with to the point that even though there are many benefits I'm not like it's not enough it does not outweigh it until it's like radically reorganizes um, and addresses what it has done, right? So like, you'll find probably not a great deal of discussion, or at least no like actual written down discussion about ALA facing its own history at any point. Um, our profession actually really is not quite that good at it. We tend, we tend to like look at our history and saying like, look how long we've existed doing cool things with books, doing cool things with people, but then we don't talk about things like, we actively participated in segregation, didn't even question it for a second. Um, Reader's Advisory comes out of a tradition of making sure that immigrants had good American books that would help them assimilate and completely drop their culture because that's garbage, obviously. Um, and lots of different things. Yeah, our class, so many of our basic classification systems are based on this idea that to find something, you should just go ahead and adopt a white cis male dead dude Western Christian perspective. Then that'll make it super easy to find. What's your problem? Like we like actually looking and sort of addressing things. Like librarians like systems, but we don't really, and we even like designing new systems, but we really are not comfortable with the idea of digging in and saying, well, what if we just eliminated this system? and built something new, because there's no space for something new until this is gone, and everybody just sort of like has a heart attack, <laughs> and it becomes like, no, because what will we do? The books would be on the floor. <laughs> it's like, put GPS trackers in them or something. <laughs> Close the library for two weeks, and write a, new, write a new way to organize these on the shelves, and try it. Um, but we're not prepared to do that. And because ALA is massive, like the idea of like, well, ALA, you're the body, you should do something. It's like, well, yeah, but if we do something, it's so huge, and it's so many moving parts, it would never, po we would never be able to get organized enough to sort of make it work and make it work for every kind of library, so they just don't. Did you ever say that library joke where it's like, how many librarians does it take to change your light bulb? Change? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although, to be clear, it's not that librarians don't like change, it's that librarians who don't like change don't like change, and yeah. they tend to be the ones who have been in the profession the longest because yeah. they don't yeah. like change. So they're here and they have, they have positions where they either are in leadership um, or have been around long enough where they have the institutional knowledge that folks constantly turn to them and it becomes like, well, it's valuable for us to continue this, this particular status quo. Like, why? It doesn't matter why. It just is. And, or they find an argument for why. And it's like, well, th but that, this being valuable doesn't preclude this also being valuable and why don't we try this, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah. 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 Oh. We'll definitely hear someone say, that's, that's, that's how we always do it. Why would we change that? <laughs> <laughs> We've always so, done it this way. Um, yeah, I just had a question about, like, because all of this is, like, making me think about if you personally as a li librarian, like, don't identify with stuff that LA does, but, like, your 
library does, like, like what do you do? And so specifically, my question is about the website that started. Like, can like for a library to say that they have like a safe space? Do, like, who in the library has control of that? I guess. And like, how would you go about convincing your library? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, one of the basically how the website works is it's um, specifically policy based. So it's not based on what the library says about itself and whether or not it's a trusted space. Um, it's more we go into their actual list of policies that are on the books um, and what they have to say if they have a hate speech policy, what their behavior policy entails, what their meeting room policy entails, and whether or not it has adequate protections for vulnerable people. Um, it doesn't necessarily go into you know, how efficiently those systems are enforced. Um, we're just going by like how it's laid out. And so again, like specific is better because if they just say, you know, we don't allow disruptive programming, that could mean potentially anything. I have no idea what that means. And it doesn't, you know, bring us safe to me. Um, but how it works is that on the website, if you go to it, the main page has a search bar and you can type in either your library name or the zip code of where the library is and it will bring up um, our analysis of whether or not we consider it a trusted library and there's um, a kind of paragraph following that about what a trusted library is according to the website and then the specific quote from policy which made us determine our judgment one way or the other um, and so the idea is for people to become more aware and active in looking into the policies of their libraries. Um, if um, it's an ongoing database that's um, largely user generated, um, <laughs> because it would be impossible for me and a couple other people from the Antifascist Library Network to log literally every policy of every library in the country. That would be a lot. I mean, if you I'm, don't mind being a I'm, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not up to it. Um, <laughs> but um, so if um, your library currently isn't on there, then it directs you to where you can add your local library and um, where to put policy, how to find it. Um, and then there's a whole page on how to go about changing your local library's policy and recommendations for how to do so and how to phrase it um, in a more trusted way. Yeah. Um, the website. Wait, can we, oh, yeah. sorry. Can you um, send us a link to it, and we can absolutely. Post it I on. also those little zines over there have um, the link in them. So um, also take one of those if you want. Yeah. Um. <laughs> and um, we have to wrap up because okay. another class is about to come in. But I just really, really want to thank you all, all the panelists for coming. This was really valuable, and I, I learned a lot from it, and I really appreciate not just you coming today but your continual um, investment in library activism and in creating spaces that are safe and inclusive and um, yeah for being part badass parts of the resistance so thank you all very much